get that. And as I said, I'll, I'll open a um, PowerPoint, hopefully, to show a few pictures. And let me see here. I have about, oh, let's see, 25 or 26 people or so uh, going right now. So that's about our usual. We'll get up to about 35 usually, but we have some that join as we start. As we're starting, let me just make the announcement. I did briefly review it in the um, email yesterday. Lord willing, we will be at the church next week, next Tuesday. That is the 16th of June, the 16th, and we will start at 9 a.m. Um, I'm going to be kind of lenient with it because uh, people are used to coming a little later. We are going to be in room 252. We will continue to do the Zoom and the recording because there is no child care and we've added a number of people who are not uh, local or who need to stay home for various reasons because of the uh, pandemic and, and all of those kinds of things. So um, we will continue, Lord willing, to resume. Now there will be a morning and an evening. And Christine, am I correct? It's seven o'clock. Yes, seven o'clock. Okay, seven o'clock. Okay. Same room. Yeah, two fifty-two as well for the evening, and that's a big room, so you'll have plenty of room to spread out. And. Um, uh, so it'll 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 work very well for us to uh, get together, and it will be good to see each other in person, and have a chance to share a little bit more during um, our discussion with the scripture. Uh, but you know, we we just need to um, feel it out like we've done with the Zoom, and see how it works all all together and I think it'll be good for us to get back and go through the summer in 252 as we plan and perhaps um, when things get back we're going to trust the Lord that we'll get back a little bit more and the school will start and uh, a lot of those rooms will uh, be used for other things so we may be going back to our original room but um, and uh, masks are certainly, you can wear your mask if you want to do that, but they're not required. And there's enough uh, space for people to be able to uh, spread out and not feel um, that they're putting themselves in into any kind of um, jeopardy. There are, um, I don't know about hand washing that, um, uh, I, I don't know if we'll have available, if you want to bring in your own, um, the, the uh, gel that you can use to wash your hands, but there's a bathroom very close. So if you need to wash your hands a little more often than you would have, but we'll meet together and we're going to trust the Lord that he'll take good care of us as he always does. And um, we will be, be there in Bible study all together. So, um, I, I, if you have uh, issues or questions or wonder about any of these things, you can email me at any time and I will get back to you as soon as I can. And um, you can also talk to uh, Angela Brown or email her at the church. She's uh, Teresa's associate assistant and or you can talk to Teresa about any of these things as well. Uh, so. We want to keep everybody informed about um, how things are changing in our lives, in our world, in our church. Okay, let's ask the Lord's blessing as we uh, begin our study in Joshua today. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, open our hearts to the marvelous truths that you have to teach us in your word that you have preserved all of this time for our instruction. 
to teach us the things that happened historically to your people that instructs us about how things go when we are needing to live in a world that is evil and full of evil and dangerous and destructive, how we can remain obedient and faithful and good servants and choose to serve you. There is so much in this marvelous book. Help us to open our hearts and our eyes to receive all of this instruction and blessing as we go through. Help me to express myself clearly um, and in a way that glorifies you. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's look at, to begin with, the terms and definitions. This is the handout that I emailed yesterday. I hope everybody was at least able to open it if you didn't print it out. But I thought it was a good time at this point where we have finished the Pentateuch, the first five books, which were the books that uh, were the instructive foundations for God's people. Uh, the picture of the kingdom of, of God on earth was uh, presented in Genesis in the Garden of Eden and how people were pushed out of the garden, out of the kingdom because of uh, sin, because of unbelief. And then further talks about God's redeeming, um, ransoming plan of grace to bring people back into relationship into his kingdom, which is <clears throat> on earth, spiritually the kingdom of God on earth. Um, and the picture that um, uh, we get from these first five books are sort of covered in these uh, words that I put here, because the, as we've read many times and in different ways in the New Testament, all of this was written for our instruction. And since we are New Covenant, New Testament believers, we need to understand the terms that are used in the Old Testament and scripture as they are applied in the new covenant and fulfilled in the new covenant because uh, the, the, uh, the first century Christians understood these terms because they, they understood from the Old Testament scriptures. That's how they were taught. And that's why it's so important for us to be taught from these Old Testament scriptures. So when we study it, we see word pictures as I said, that are merged, that uh, are used to sort of not, not entirely symbolically, but similar to symbols that teach us meanings more than or along with uh, the actual historical facts. So both of the things happen. Egypt is a place that has existed since very early. It was established by the sons of Ham, who uh, right from the ark. So it is, it is an actual place, and it has a, a history, a very rich and long history. But um, it can also be symbolically understood, as I have here, um, as uh, the place of a picture of the kingdom of earth, which is ruled by Satan. Uh, it is full of idolatry. Um, uh, they worship other gods, many, many, hundreds of gods, and they had uh, gods of the of the sun and of the moon and of frogs and of the river and all kinds of gods that they worshipped. And it is the picture of Earth's Egypt, this world's bondage um, uh, um, under sin and under death and under penalty um, of God's wrath. And that um, being delivered from this bondage, from this sin, 
from God's wrath is the picture of being delivered from Egypt. And the thing that made the delivery uh, possible and, and, and the picture of it was the Passover. The Passover was people by faith followed the instruction to put the uh, blood of their sacrificial lamb over the door, painted over the door, and the angel of death would pass over them. That was the picture of grace which we bring to the cross because it was uh, the same picture that we have of the, it, it showed the picture and the forecasting of the event of the cross, the Lord dying, his blood being shed to cover our sin, and we receive it by faith. Same thing, by God's grace uh, through our faith. So the picture of Egypt is going from darkness to light or the picture of salvation, or being delivered from the bondage of sin. And that's why it's so important that Moses would say so many times, you don't want to go back to Egypt. You can't go back to Egypt. Don't choose to go back to Egypt, even though it seemed like a better place than the place you were at that particular time. Kadesh, uh, Kadesh Barnea, the wilderness, we talked about that. I don't want to spend too much time on each one of these things because it's, I kind of spent a good bit of time discussing it in writing here. Uh, but uh, Kadesh is that point where most of us as believers have to come, or I wouldn't say most, I would say all of us as believers have to come to the point where our faith is tested. Will we trust God or not? Will we choose to follow him or not? And that for the first generation of um, Israel, they chose to not follow. And because of that, they were uh, left in the wilderness until they died. The believer must choose to move out of the wilderness and cross the Jordan in the picture of Joshua to inherit the promise. They should have crossed into the promised land from Kadesh, but they chose not to. The Ark of God for the Old Covenant and for all of the Old Testament was a sign and a symbol of the presence of God among them. Today, that's the Holy Spirit within us, but they have the same idea. The people of God have the presence of God among them. He is the king in the kingdom, even though it is a spiritual um, experience now, it is just as real as if it were geographically. Now, eventually there will be the kingdom of God on earth, and that is the millennial kingdom, and the king will reign among us there as well. Canaan is uh, another name for the promised land. This is the land that was promised to Abraham in the Abrahamic covenant. It is an unconditional forever covenant. It, it involves geographic land, which God actually outlined using uh, geographic landmarks. And, uh, but it's also a picture of our spiritual inheritance. So um, the spiritual inheritance for us, the promised land is a picture of rest and blessing to those who overcome by faith. And it is the, the same thing, um, the same statement that was given to Abraham was also given to Joshua, and that is, I will give you every place in this kingdom where you set your foot. That is that spirit of <clears throat> faithful overcoming uh, while we're here um, in the spiritual kingdom, while we're here on earth. Read again Hebrews 4.3 which shows us this picture in the new covenant. The crossing of Jordan 
and I did, <coughs> sorry, let me mute myself here for a second. Sorry about that. Crossing of Jordan is not like sometimes a lot of the songs, and they're not biblical, and they're not scriptural, because they paint the picture that crossing the Jordan is like crossing from um, death or life here on earth through death into heaven. That's not really the picture that we see uh, presented in the book of Joshua. It is a picture of crossing by faith through the death of self, which is salvation, um, and coming into the new life, which is the picture of our spiritual inheritance, the kingdom of God on earth, spiritual inheritance inheritance and this inheritance is eternal life as well as all the blessings and promises of god they are we get that um inheritance upon our new birth we do not have to wait until we die to inherit um our blessings although we will get um, the uh, reality of all the marvelousness of that someday in glory. But uh, this picture of crossing the Jordan is marked by the phrase, you must be strong and of great courage. And we'll read that here in just a minute with uh, first verse, some of the first verses of chapter one. It's used um, several times in this book. This seems to be the theme. In order to live in the kingdom of God on earth, that is that spiritual inheritance that we have, it requires us to be strong and of great courage. And we need to receive this gift of inheritance by seizing, by faith, seizing that blessing. Uh, again, once we've crossed the Jordan into the land, we are to take or receive our inheritance, which has been appointed to us. That is our life. Wherever it is, we're appointed to live physically in this earth and to work in and to bring about fruit, bear fruit in the appointed place that we are brought to live while physically while we're here on earth. Uh, the psalmist writes in Psalm 16, uh, uh, verse nine there, that this is a pleasant place. When we realize where we are, where we're living, what we're doing, uh, how, we, how we've been provided for, I think we need to just thank God for the pleasant place that he's put us. It may not be fancy or <clears throat> particularly nice or convenient or any of those things, but it is a pleasant place because we're in the place that has been uh, appointed for us and where we um, are meant to serve. Circumcision. Um, and then, uh, which is there, the sign of the covenant, and it is um, um, for us in the new uh, covenant, having uh, the, this, um, uh, the one that is there in, I believe it's in Colossians 2, that I've uh, written there for you, um, having been buried with him in baptism, we were raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. And that is our um, uh, new birth and our coming into, by promise, into our spiritual inheritance. Rest then, and I gave quite a long uh, discussion there about rest very important for us to understand that rest is a spiritual status 
it is not that we have to have died and gone to heaven in order to enjoy God's rest. It is part of our inheritance. It's uh, the peace that God gives us while we're here. It is our confidence. It is the thing which we build our faith on. It's a believer's rest. It's given to us as part of our inheritance from our very inception of the new birth. So hopefully this is helpful. I'll get to these lessons hopefully um, uh, at the that we can get from this when we get to the end of the book. But uh, I hope that's helpful for us so that we have terms that we, now we'll see these terms used for the rest of the Old Testament and into the New Testament. So in order for us to all be speaking the same language, I thought it might be helpful for us to do that. So let's look at this picture. I'm going to call it courageous discipleship because the picture here is that Joshua is given a commission to take the second generation of Israel across the Jordan River and into uh, the land called Canaan at that time, uh, which is the picture of the uh, promised land. This was the land promised by covenant to Abraham, and it is a forever promise, and it is a an actual geographic location as well as a picture um, spiritually. I'm going to call it courageous uh, discipleship because the leader Joshua is a type of Jesus. Their names mean the same. Jesus is Joshua in Greek. Uh, Joshua is the Hebrew name, but it means uh, salvation. And it is an important word. Moses gave Joshua his name. We read about that. And he is uh, the designated leader to take him across into the promised land, which again is a picture. And he does so by saying, follow me. Follow me across. And that's exactly what the Lord Jesus did to all the ones who began uh, the church um, in the New Testament. Follow me. So let's look at the first chapter, and we'll kind of hope for the clock to stop here, but it isn't. <clears throat> we'll see how far we can get. And I would encourage you to study this book, um, looking at it very carefully, because there's many lessons here. Okay, be strong and courageous. I'm going to share my screen here for a second. Um, let's see here. And let me get it on the slideshow. And from the beginning. And uh, let me get rid of this. Can you see that okay? I hope you can see that okay. But this is just a map. And um, over here on the um, eastern side of the Jordan River, this would be the east side of the Jordan River, Shittim is the base camp where they were, Bel Peor is where Balaam uh, was, and we spoke about all of that. But they're getting ready to cross the Jordan River um, just about the spring time of the year. This will be just before the Passover month. Uh, we'll see that here in just a minute. But it's in the spring time of the year, and this river is flooding at the springtime. So it's way over its banks. Um, it is not... Um, going to be an easy thing, but Joshua is told to go from from Shittim across the river at a particular place, and they will end up in this place called Gilgal on the other side. Now, they, of course, did not know what the, the land would look like, what it would be like, except for Joshua and um, uh, Caleb, who were the only two who had been there before. And I just put this very carefully here, uh, or uh, just briefly here rather. And it is the route from Kadesh, uh, the bottom here, K uh, Kadesh Barnea, all the way to the top. 
and it is the route that the spies took to uh, scout out the land. So Joshua and Caleb would have remembered seeing these places 38 years before. Uh, uh, it's a long time, but they would have remembered these things and so would have had an idea about what geographically um, the uh, lay of the land was and sort of what things were, but they had no idea how to uh, really where they were going or, or what steps to take. So we find that this whole thing is going to be a um, uh, following by faith the leadership of the Lord who speaks through his man, Joshua that he has chosen. And this is the commission, which is found in verses six through uh, nine, which I just uh, recorded here for us to kind of look through, uh, because I wanted you to see that three times in these three verses, God tells him this very important <laughs> phrase, be strong and courageous. You, <clears throat> But he's not saying you have to be strong in yourself or courageous in yourself, but in order to be faithful and stay faithful and to overcome, it requires us to be strong and courageous. So the um, commission is be strong and courageous for you, uh, that is you, Joshua, will distribute the land <coughs> I, which is the Lord who's speaking to him, swore to their fathers to give them an inheritance. So this is the fulfilling, <coughs> the next step in the fulfilling of the prophecy that was inherent in the covenant with Abraham. And he follows it up. Above all, the thing you're going to need is to be strong and very courageous. And then three steps. Be careful to observe. That, <clears throat> that would be to um, obey. That's the uh, key word here. Not just look at, but to obey. To do the whole instruction my servant Moses commanded you. That would be that book which Moses referred to, which was uh, put beside the Ark of the Covenant to be taken in. That was his uh, instruction manual. That's the word of God for us. Observe the whole instruction that was given uh, by inspiration. We have the same um, mandate to enter in the promised land. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left so that you will have success wherever you go. So deviating from the word will produce failure because it says here, if you stay right in the center of God's word, neither to the right or to the left, you will have success. And the book of instruction, that's that book that Moses uh, referred to and that Joshua knew about, specifically, probably had it in his hand, must not depart from your mouth. In other words, when you speak, you're speaking from my instruction, not from your own. You are to recite it day and night. Look at how he talks about God's word. You are to recite it day and night so that you may carefully observe or obey everything written in it. For then you will prosper and succeed. So what is our key to understanding this? Our new life in the promised land must involve daily careful following of the instruction in God's word. That's what we're doing now, studying God's word to find out what instruction is there for how we live. And then he finishes this. This is the Lord talking to uh, Joshua. He finishes and says, haven't I commanded you? And this is now the third time, be strong and courageous. This isn't a suggestion that the Lord is giving uh, Joshua. This is a command. 
let's take it as that for ourselves. We are commanded to be strong and courageous, not fearful, not timid, not unwilling to carry out the instructions that are given to us in our life uh, by the Lord. Don't be afraid or discouraged. Two different things. Don't be fearful or discouraged, like, oh, I'm so tired, I want to give up. This isn't working out like I thought. Don't get discouraged. Why? Because the Lord your God is with you. Not just some places, but wherever you go. I think this is such an important thing for us. They began to go across, <clears throat> preparing to go across the river. At this point, they remember they're on the east side of the Jordan, and they're going to be moving across the Jordan into the promised land. So second... Um, uh, chapter talks about Rahab. I'd like to spend some time on that. That's a marvelous picture. But when you read that story, you have to know that Rahab had been prepared by God before those spies ever came in. Because she tells us that we knew, we here in uh, Jericho knew that God was going to give you the land. <clears throat> it's, it's right there. She didn't know when the battle was going to happen. She had to trust the Lord, too, because she left that scarlet cord out of her window, not just a couple of days, but probably for a couple of weeks, because there was a preparation time that had to happen in Israel before Jericho would be taken. And James um, and, and Hebrew tell, refer to Hebrew, or refer to Rahab, um, and about this incident. So it was faith that she put that scarlet cord out. Psalms 105 there is a psalm that tells about uh, taking the land and keeping the statutes and following the instruction to enter this, uh, this land. And I'm going to speak of it um, both geographically now, but refer, just remember the whole thing is a spiritual picture. So uh, the spies come back, and they are now prepared uh, with some knowledge about what the city looks like, what the obstacle is ahead. But that's not going to help them at all, because Joshua is going to be told that it's not going to be a battle like you think. So chapters 3 and 4, and a little bit of... Uh, five, tell us about the preparation that the people of God have to go through in order to enter the land. There are two or three things I think we have to kind of mention here. The first thing is we need to follow the Lord, and the picture here in chapter three is it is the ark of the Lord, the presence of the Lord, which must go before you. We follow the presence of the Lord. We don't go ahead. We follow. And that was clearly presented here. And we follow at a distance. In this case, in actuality, they were to follow a thousand yards between themselves and the ark. And uh, they had to consecrate themselves um, in order to be prepared, that is, to make themselves pure and ready. And then they are presented, the Israel was presented with its first test of faith, as well as Joshua the leader, because it was said they had to wait until the feet of these priests. Now, these are... This is the way the ark is to be carried, and these are priests of the Kohath, Kohathite uh, priests that are designated to be the ones who are responsible for the furnishings of the ark, and they had to wait until their feet was in the water. 
it couldn't be before. It couldn't be, let's wait until the waters part and then we'll go in. It had to be that you, when the feet of the priest who carry the ark, this is verse uh, chapter um, three, verse 13. When the feet of the priest who carry the ark of the Lord Um, cross, um, the, and it, it speaks there in verse 13, the Lord of the whole earth. When they come to rest in the Jordan's waters, the waters will be cut off. So this was a test of faith. These men had to walk into the water and it was flooded water by then. So they didn't know where the bank was or any of those things. They had to walk into the water. And then the people were to follow. As soon as they got in, the water um, piled up. And this is sort of the Red Sea experience for the second generation. It means the same thing. Uh, by faith, moving from death to life, moving from darkness to light, um, in faith, receiving the picture of salvation. Um, dying to self, dying to the old life, and uh, coming into the new life. Um, it is felt and um, geographically that this is exactly the spot on the Jordan River where 1,500 years later, John the Baptist was baptizing uh, the people of Israel who were choosing to be. So uh, this picture is all of the tribe. Now this is about two and a half million people again, all ages, men, women, children, sick people, old people, animals, all of their belongings, all in one cross by faith into a land that they don't know exactly what it's going to be like, but by faith, they're trusting God. This is another picture where uh, they were told to pick up stones from the Jordan. And there were two times uh, the stones were to be taken. They were to take stones to the bank and they were to leave stones in the center of the, um, of the river bank when the water would come back over it. These are going to be symbols that we'll see all through the book of Joshua, where we have um, uh, stones of remembrance. Stones of remembrance are not to be idols. They're not to be things that are worshiped. These are supposed to be um, stones which uh, in the case of Joshua, stones which would give people something tangible to look at, which would then recall to their memory uh, the events that that uh, described. Uh, this, these stones that were brought out of the Jordan River here, out of the Jordan River and put on the camp were to be placed in um, a location, geographic location called Gilgal. And Gilgal actually is a word that means circle of stones. It's the stones of remembrance to be visible memorials, never idols, never was there to be worship of these, but it was a stone of remembrance. I think it's true that the Lord wants us to establish historical markers that commemorates what he's done in our lives. And we can do that even today. And it's important that some article perhaps, or some uh, place you've written in your Bible or some um, picture or something or other that you have that you can refer to and that reminds you of what the Lord did for you at that event. It is not a plaything of worship, but a thing to remember what the Lord has done. The Lord cares about what we remember. And he actually told Joshua to set up these stones of uh, remembrance because it is important to remember clearly what the Lord 
wants to uh, to to have us remember about <clears throat> how he worked in our lives at that time, and it is also important because he says he wants to use these remembrances as a place to teach our children about his faithfulness, God's faithfulness, and they are concrete images that can be remembered throughout life. Um, I, I took a minute to write down uh, on this slide, I don't know how well you can see it, but there were a number all the way through to the last chapter, a number of times when Joshua used stones in various ways by altar or just heaps of stones or whatever to mark an event that needed to be remembered. It was a turning point in the life of Israel. So uh, we have that picture of the stones of remembrance to remember God's faithfulness in our lives. Now uh, we move to the next section, which are the battles. Now we're familiar with the battles, but these battles are not just recorded in scripture for us to think about having to fight battles, although it is a picture of spiritual warfare for us as well, actual battles. And so we need to understand how to do the fighting. And I think it's just kind of interesting um, to uh, see the tactics and strategies that the Lord taught uh, Joshua as the general or the leader of these people about how to fight battles. Because remember, these were not, this was not a standing army all trained with military equipment and chariots and horses and all the th implements of that time. Uh, they were not warriors in the sense of the uh, people in Jericho were warriors. Uh, and this was a massive walled city that had been standing for many, many years. It was well established, well fortified, well equipped. They could have stayed inside those gates for a couple of years and um, there would have been no way for Israel to siege it. So it had to be a strategy and the lessons that we learn from the battles that are presented for us here in the book of Joshua are that the battle is the Lord's. He, all the fighting that we do is to be following the instructions of how we are to uh, carry out battles figuratively, spiritually speaking, as well as the actual battles that we may have to fight. I put here the first battle was sort of the battle of an attitude that has to be um, taken. Let's look at the the strategy, um, let's see if we, let me get my note here. Uh, the strategy of the, uh, of the carrying out or the defeating of the people in Jericho, the whole city of Jericho. Now this was the very first place that they had to come. I, I kind of moved over some of the preparations. I don't want to, I don't, maybe we should go back, but uh, the people had crossed the river. They made camp. There was no more manna. They were eating off the land that we see this in, in chapters four and five. They had gotten across. They were eating off the land. They were out of the wilderness. Um, they had set up camp at Gilgal, and the the thing that we're told in chapter five is the men who would uh, who were of Israel at that time had to be circumcised because those who were born in the wilderness had not been circumcised. And as a sign of belonging, being a part of the covenant of God was the picture of circumcision. And I talked about that in our terms, so I won't spend too much time, but Joshua made this statement that of preparation that the circumcision 
being circumcised and being declared as part of the God's people by covenant, by uh, allegiance, that uh, he, he writes in uh, chapter 5, verse 9, Today I have rolled away the disgrace of Egypt from you. Therefore, this place shall be called Gilgal today. That is the same picture uh, that the Apostle Paul talks about. The circumcision of the heart is removing the flesh, the flesh of sin and death from us and being circumcised to new life. It's a spiritual picture as well. So uh, the preparation has to be made. And then so because they were physically circumcised, there had to be some time between the spies coming back from Jericho till the actual time when they were going to go to battle. So all this time, Rahab had to keep her household and the people that she was um, wanted to, to be saved from the battle that she knew was coming. She had to stay there and she couldn't tell anybody. Nobody could know anything about it. And uh, so we don't know how long that was, but it was probably at least a week. These men had to wait until they were whole after their physical circumcision. So the instructions about circling this obstacle, the first obstacle uh, to um, overcoming and taking the land, Jericho, had to be met. And that sort of gives us the strategy about how to overcome huge, <clears throat> immense, almost indestructible uh, obstacles that we see in our lives. The first one is we walk around it. And that's what uh, the, the uh, message, I believe, of, of uh, Jericho is. We have to walk around, but we walk around following the ark. That's the picture that is given to us in this, uh, uh, the sixth chapter of uh, Jericho, of, of Joshua. The uh, Jericho was a symbol of the curse. It was an evil place. It was an idolatrous place. But they were to walk around this. It was going to be defeated, but Joshua was told by the Lord, I will give you the victory. Follow my instructions. You were to walk around, and they were to walk around the entire city, which would have taken about a day, and there were uh, 40,000 men who were selected, not all the men of, of um Israel, but 40,000 men, and they walked around once a day for six days, and on the seventh day, they walked seven times around, and at the end of the seventh time of walking around, they were to blow their trumpets and shout, and the wall came tumbling down when that happened. What in the world was God trying to teach about this uh, strategy of warfare, I think it was, you walk around, I'm going to give you the victory, you're not going to do it yourself, but you walk around um, following my presence, and when your attitude has changed to the point where I understand you are uh, by faith following me, wholly and, and actually, it may take seven days for your attitude to change, but when you're there, you'll be ready to follow, and, and then your attitude will be adjusted to follow, and you will have a different attitude toward the obstacle. Now, the obstacle is to be defeated by God, but we are to understand what that defeat of the obstacle, the, the thing that God wants to destroy in our lives, what does that mean? It was a marvelous victory. 
they were to go in and take all of the things that were of value from this destroyed city all the people were destroyed except Rahab and her family who were um, by faith taken out um, but uh, there were a couple of things that came from that uh, they were to take all of the valuable stuff and give it to the work of the tabernacle taking care of the tabernacle, taking care of the Levitical priests that, that were responsible because they would not get an inheritance and they would need to be supported. And the other thing was there was never to be built anything on this location geographically. And there was a curse and it was called Joshua's curse uh, that whoever rebuilds the city is, will be cursed of the Lord. It, when you lay the foundation, you will lose your firstborn. When you lay, uh, finish the gates, you will have your youngest. So we read about that actually happening. It came, uh, came to pass uh, about 500 years later during the days of Ahab. And we'll read about that when we get to 1 Kings. Um, a, a man laid his, uh, the foundation and he was a man named Hael from Bethel, and he lost his two sons because uh, he refused to listen to the curse that the Lord had placed on it. Well, Israel is now feeling very good. They have defeated. They see it as a defeat, and so they uh, are rejoicing. They're glad. They are resting up a little bit after uh, battle. But Joshua says it's time to move on to the next town, which is Ai or I. And so they go, uh, uh, go ahead and ch uh, chapter seven. Um, uh, they were uh, moving on to Ai, but the problem was uh, they were defeated. They lost 36 men, and Joshua falls on his face before the Lord. This is chapter 7, verse 6, and was uh, a Torah's clothes, and he stayed there, and God came in, ch in chapter 7, verse 10, and said, what are you doing lying there on the ground? Get up. Israel has sinned. There is sin in the camp, and you have got to find it and get rid of it. So sin in the camp is the next lesson we learn. Um, very often when we are flush with victory, we forget to move on to the next step in the spirit of the Lord. And so Joshua moved ahead of asking the Lord if it was time to go to Ai, and if he had, he would have been told, no, you can't go until you get rid of the sin that's in your camp. The picture is that when there is sin in the camp, when there is, the camp is a picture of the church today. That is the place of the people of God where all the people of God, Israel, um, together, that is in the camp um, in the Old Testament. And... The startling statement that the Lord tells uh, Joshua in chapter 7, and it will be the end of verse 12. I will no longer be with you unless you remove from among you what is set apart and, and repent. And so Joshua sets about uh, to uh, find out who has brought sin, and they find out. It was a fellow by the name of Achan and his family had taken some things that by greed and by lust had said, oh, this is beautiful. This is wonderful. Nobody will miss this. Even though they were told they can't have it for themselves, they took it. He buried it in his tent. And so once they found out who it was, Achan uh, does confess uh, to Joshua asking him to confess and um, Achan in verse 20 of chapter 7 says, I've sinned against the Lord, the God of Israel. And he explains what he did. And um, the, uh, Joshua then has to carry out the sentence that 
uh, the Lord had told him, and he, uh, because this, the Lord had said, stand up, Israel has sinned. They have violated my covenant that I appointed with them. I will no longer be with you unless you remove what is set apart, which is the, the lesson we have. If there is sin in our lives, if there is sin in our church, if there is sin amongst our believers, we need to find out what it is and it must be removed permanently. These people were stoned. The whole family was stoned. That was the sentence of death because they had caused the whole camp to sin. The whole of this uh, had been led astray. After the um, repentance that happened, they are then sent back to AI, and there is a massive, wonderful um, victory. And AI is here is Gilgal here on the near the bank of the Jordan where the camp was, and we read about the strategy of defeating AI in uh, chapter eight. I won't go through all of the details, but uh, AI was essentially destroyed. Uh, it was quite a, a, a setup of, of being uh, ambushed and tricked and all sorts of strategies for defeating this particular enemy, but it was set out by God as another site to be totally destroyed. And so it was burned, it was totally destroyed to the ground um, as God had told them. Uh, so AI is the next thing, uh, next battle that we learn from. Because of this, the uh, kings, all the kings that are surrounding uh, these two cities, Jericho and AI. Now, AI was much smaller in a whole different town than Jericho, but they were two uh, fairly prominent places right in the center of the country all the kings around decided, uh-oh, we're in trouble. They're, these people are going to destroy us all. And in verse chapter 9, verse 2, they formed a unified alliance to fight against Joshua and Israel. So uh, we find out about Gibeon. Gibeon is the next, uh, Gibeon is a place, a location, and on this map, you can see it's just to the south of AI here. Gibeon is uh, another a fairly large town. It'll later be called Gibeah, but it's the same place. Gibeon is a place that actually was a, a sort of the little city that had several cities or villages associated with it right around it. And so they came up with a different strategy to fight uh, Joshua and Israel, and they use deception. That's another tool that Satan uses in spiritual warfare, deception. And Joshua, unfortunately, fell for it. And we find out why uh, Joshua and the people of Israel, um, because we see... Um, that they made an alliance with these people. And we see in verse, chapter 9, verse 14, then the men of Israel took some of their provision, but they did not see the Lord's decision. That was the big problem that uh, often Israel and we face. We go into a situation which we have no knowledge that it's going to turn out badly for us. We make a decision, but we don't seek the Lord before we go in. And that's the problem. You make a vow, you have to keep it. They had made a vow to have an ally, make an alliance with these people of Gibeah, and they find out that um, these cities, the, there are four cities that are sort of grouped together. Um, they, they, pulled up a trick on Joshua so that they would not be attacked, and it was clearly a deception. But because Israel had made a vow, they had to keep it. And we will see through the rest of the Old Testament 
that uh, this will affect things, this whole uh, situation with Gibeah. But this was uh, something that then forced Israel to do things uh, that they might not have had to do, but because the, they had put themselves in this situation, um, they had become a, essentially part of Israel. As when you m make a treaty with another nation and you agree that you will protect them, then you uh, have to keep that vow and whatever happens to them is going to affect you. And that's what happened with uh, Gibeah. Uh, before we get to that, I need to go to, uh, let's see. I better go to the five kings. Um, But before that, I think I've skipped the place about going to um, let me go to this one and then we'll come back. The five kings that are spoken about in chapter 10. Let's go there next. Chapter 10 talks about the five kings that are listed there. These are towns which have decided they're going to defeat Israel by going against Gibeon. They'll use Gibeah as their staging area in a because that's where uh, Israel is now in alliance and they think that they can defeat Israel in that way. And we find out uh, the miraculous techniques that God uses again in this battle, which are quite different uh, than the ones for Jericho or for Ai. Uh, we find that there is surprise and confusion and they're being chased uh, these uh, large group uh, of people in the five kings, when their armies go, uh, it's a very large group. They outnumber by many times Israel. And so they are the Amorite uh, kings, or all five of them are Amorite kings. When they go against Gibeon, they are essentially going against um, Israel as well. And God is going to defend his people. And Joshua, um, they had just um, gone back to Gilgal and settled in and marched all night and got to Gibeah. And they uh, uh, began to fight, and, but the Lord sent hailstones. And it says in chapter 10 that there were more, chapter 10, verse 11, more died from the hail than the Israelites killed with their sword. And this is the day that God, that Joshua said, well, Lord, we're going to need more time to finish this battle than we have daylight. We don't have enough daylight left to finish this battle. So he asked the Lord to hold the sun so that they could finish the battle. This is another um, a very good lesson for us to ask the Lord to give us the resources, the strength, the even unnatural things, uh, supernatural things that can be provided to allow us to defeat the enemy that is before us, whatever that enemy happens to be. And in this case, it was the five Amorite kings. He had already sent hail. They were already fighting. There was very close to defeating all five of these kings and um, in battle, in actual battle. And Joshua said, I need more time. And God provided for him. Uh, it says in uh, chapter 10, verse 12, Joshua spoke to the Lord in the presence of Israel, sun stand still over Gibeon and moon over the valley of Ajalon. And the moon stood still and the moon stopped until the nation took vengeance on its enemies. A marvelous supernatural experience that all of Israel got to see. The sun stood still. I have no idea how that happened any more than I know how any other creation or God's miracle is. I don't try to explain it. I just take it by faith. 
and understand that the teaching in God's word is when we need supernatural events to help us in the defeat of our enemy because God knows we are fighting against principalities and powers. And so it is important for us to know that if we ask the Lord, he will send supernatural uh, events to help us uh, with it. Uh, the long story is they, uh, they did take the land. Uh, they did uh, defeat all the enemies. And we see in chapter 12 that 31 kings in all have been uh, defeated and the land is essentially uh, under the rule of Israel. Let me go back to um, this one. Let's see, All right back to this one just for a minute because I do want to uh, go back to the um, experience that uh, remember um, Moses had told them when they were still um, at Shittim that they were to find, as soon as they got into the land, they were to go to the, um, let me find the verses I want, I want to mention here. Uh, too many pieces of paper here. Uh, to, Is it back in chapter eight, verse? Yeah, yeah I think it is. Thank you. Thirty-three. Um, I read right over it. Yeah, chapter yeah. eight, and we're down. I want to take you to uh, all the way down to thirty, verse thirty. Uh, this is actually uh, where Moses had told them the two mountains that they were to go to, verse 30. Let's go ahead and go uh, to verse 30, where Joshua built an altar on Mount Ebal. Ebal is, now if you, if you enter the land um, coming from the east, traveling west, uh, today that place is called, um, it, or later on it would be called Shechem. Um, not clear that it was called that at that time, but Mount Ebal would be sort of the northerly one, and Mount Gerizim is the southerly one. It's not important for us to see the actual geographic thing, but to look at the lesson that these two uh, were that they were carrying out the instruction that Moses had given to Joshua to read the book of the law to the people of Israel all at one time and that the tribes were to be divided six on one mountain and six on the other and one was to pronounce the curses and one was to pronounce the blessings in the center here where Shechem would be would be the Levitical tribe who were calling out the curses which would then be sort of antiphonally responded to the shouted out and these two mountains exist today you can see them today they are not it is not unusual to think that uh, they could be heard but the picture here is to uh, ratify the covenant that God had given them and the uh, in the covenantal um, ratification was to be verbal and it was to then this is the mosaic covenant that was given to them in the wilderness and that they would uh, that they understood that disobedience would bring curses and obedience would be bring blessings and that they were while they were in the land they were to be obedient and follow and keep the covenant of the Lord. And we see that um, um, Joshua was a very good one to make sure that every little piece of instruction, uh, both from Moses and from the Lord, would be carried out. So <clears throat> um, there are 
profit, prophetic things from this as well, but we don't have time to go through them. We're, we're running out of time. Let me go through. I don't want to miss the end of the book or the, or the finishing up, but let's go ahead and, and move ahead um, a little bit. Thank you for helping me find places. Uh, but the battles continue until they get 31, total of 31 belong. But look at chapter 13. And we find out that um, the Lord speaking to Joshua, and he said, you have become old, advanced in age, but a great deal of the land remains to be possessed. That picture is... Um, it's a lifelong thing. It's a generational thing to um, keep the kingdom of God on earth um, in, amongst the people of God. And so um, it, is, it is a continuing thing to fight the battles. And they were told, and we have here the first time we're uh, sort of introduced to the group of the five Philistine rulers. We're going to see those in Judges as a major uh, part of the experience that Israel will have. But the picture is you have to keep fighting. Even after you've defeated the kings, you have to keep fighting to hold the land. But after the fighting is done and after they have uh, overcome the obstacles that they have had, it's important to then uh, see that uh, faithfulness produces good outcomes. Promises are kept to the faithful. God's promises are kept for those who are faithful. And we see that most of the land was occupied here. Most of the, at this time known as Canaan, uh, was occupied. Uh, they didn't actually build cities. They just moved right into the cities that were there. They set up the um, uh, tabernacle at Shechem. Uh, near the mountains that we just talked about and um, set up the ark. The Levites uh, set up camp there, but um, the, all of Israel was uh, sort of at rest. And it says there at the end of chapter um, 11, let's see. We're actually at the chapter, yeah, at the end of chapter 11, verse 23. Joshua took the entire land in keeping with all that the Lord had told Moses. Joshua then gave it as an inheritance to Israel according to the tribal allotments. And after this, the land had rest from war. So they didn't have sort of the end of the world war at that time all of this Canaan was at war they were given rest from war and uh, were able then to claim their inheritance and we see that by lot it was appointed Eliezer the the chief priest or high priest and Joshua uh, the, and the heads of the families distributed by lot um, at Shiloh in the presence of the Lord um, the entrance of the tent of meetings, that's a tabernacle, and they so they divided up the land, and we can see that there were places given to each um, of the tribes, except for, of course, the Levites, who were uh, not to have a particular piece of property, but were to be spread throughout all of Israel, and they were to be given 24 cities to dwell in, and there were to be uh, cities of refuge, six cities of refuge uh, were to be given as well. So let's move on then to, um, let me stop sharing and come back to the ending. We're um, running out of time here, but what I want you to see is at the end of it, they've got their, uh, tribal inheritance they have set up the uh, cities of refuge they have 
uh, each of the um, Levite families have uh, cities where they set up and they will set up places where they can do instruction of the next generation and um, and and the present generation there will be uh, time for um, uh, rest and relaxation and enjoying the benefits of living in the land uh, we see individual word pi word pictures of Caleb and his taking of Hebron remember Caleb was the other spy that was faithful with Joshua and Moses had said even though you're not one of the tribes you're going to be given your own place in the new land because of your faithfulness so he was given Hebron uh, and we'll read about Hebron from now on in the Old Testament. So we come to the last chapter. They've conquered the land. They're living in the land. They've divided up their inheritance. They have, uh, by faith, kept the promise that God has given them. And Joshua comes to the end of his life and the end of his running. And we see, I think, we need to see very clearly God did not tell Joshua like he did Moses choose this particular person to take your place to lead Israel he did not do that he did not choose the next uh, leader uh, so uh, when we go into judges that's the third generation and they do not have a designated leader and we see in these last chapters, uh, last chapter of Judges, or excuse me, Joshua, and in the first chapter uh, of Judges, we find out that they had no king and they had no leader. And the third generation um, does not start off as well, does not fare as well as the second generation. Lesson again for us. Joshua then comes to the end of his life and the end of the time of inheriting the land, inheriting the promise, and um, having the uh, benefit of all the defeats in, of battle and all the people times they defeated um, others in battle and gained the victory. He comes, he said, but this is what the Lord God of Israel says, and then he goes through their history. This is chapter 24, goes through their history, beginning with the Abraham's father. This is the only time we read about Abraham's father, Terah, um, and his brother Nahor are living there in the Euphrates River, and they worshiped other gods. They were idolatrous, but God took Abraham from that region and brought him into the land and that's the beginning of the promise of a particular geographic area on the earth that is to belong to the lord and is given an, an, as an inheritance to his people it will be the site of the actual kingdom on earth when the lord jesus comes again he goes through a lot of history he goes through how they fought all of these and we have in uh, verse 11 of chapter 24 all of the people groups that uh, were conquered and these are the same ones that are listed in Genesis for um, uh, Abraham as a prophetic statement that these groups have to come under the um, victory or authority of the people of God Israel and all of the things we come to the therefore in chapter 24 I've told you all this history reminded you of all these events therefore verse 14 fear the Lord and worship him in sincerity in truth after all of the battles after everything when you're living in the land this is what is important fear the lord worship him in sincerity and truth get rid of the gods of your father that your fathers worship beyond the euphrates river and in egypt and worship the lord 
reminding they came from idolatry. They were delivered from idolatry. Stay out of idolatry. That is um, obeying um, self, uh, following your own ideas, choosing to follow the Lord, choosing God above any other God. Verse 15, there's a but. Therefore, fear the Lord. But if it doesn't please you to worship the Lord, which is, that's the choice you have. You can choose the Lord or not. If you don't choose the Lord, choose for yourselves today who you're going to worship. That's exactly the statement that was given by Elijah on Mount Carmel to Israel at a, um, many hundreds of years later. It is a choice that we have always, even if we are children in the promise, living in the land, we still have choices. Who are we following? Who are we going to stay faithful to? Who will we obey no matter what choose today choose today who you're going to worship the gods of your fathers or the god um the one true god the god of israel and this is where he makes a statement that most people this is all they remember from the uh, book of Joshua, maybe the Battle of Jericho and this, as for me and my family, we will worship the Lord. That is the statement of faith that we all have to be able to daily make. I'm not choosing this world. I'm going to worship the Lord. Then he makes a sort of a sad statement. The end of this book. Joshua makes this statement in verse 19. You will not be able to worship the Lord. Why? Because he is holy. He's jealous. And he will not forgive your transgressions and sins. And the people said, oh, no, no, no. We're going to worship the Lord. We will worship the Lord. We will worship the Lord. And, and Joshua said, no. You are witnesses against yourselves that you yourselves have chosen to worship the Lord. He was sort of prophetically because he must have seen the third generation coming up and not being as faithful or perhaps um, seeming to be uh, willing to fear the Lord and follow. We find that um, Joshua, uh, Joshua now comes to the end of his life, and he dies at 110. We are now about 35 years since they crossed the Jordan. We are at now entering the third generation, coming into uh, adulthood and ruling in um, Israel. And the end of Joshua, his, the faithful serv servant of the Lord, has died. He was an Ephraimite, that is the tribe of Ephraim, and so they buried him in the uh, land that was um, inherited for Ephraim. Notice they also have brought Joseph's bones. Now, they have kept Joseph's bones for now almost 100 years. The, since they left Egypt, they carried Joseph's bones all through the wilderness, all through all these years of battle. They've got these bones and they bury them in Shechem. And they also, and we also find out that Eliezer, the son of Aaron, that is the priest that followed Aaron and was the high priest during all of these years of battle, he dies and his son Phineas. Uh, takes over. So all of these events are sort of recorded as the closing, and then we see the sad chapters of the beginning of Josh of Judges, which we'll talk about next time. So, kind of
kind of an overview. I put some lessons there that I had um, uh, enjoyed from Warren Wearsby, who, by the way, I don't know if you knew, I just found out not too long ago that he died, went home to be with the Lord May the 3rd, just uh, a little over a month ago. Anyway, um, we find here God's plan for victory while we're living in the land of promise in the promised land that is our spiritual promised land kingdom here on earth we conquer the land by following god's word we trust his promise for victory we obey and follow the plan exactly no matter how strange god's instructions may seem it must have seemed very strange to um, uh, Joshua to be told to march around the city seven times, seven days. The victory will glorify the Lord and cause the enemy to fear and the people to see who God is. And then they will want to trust him also. Before I go, let me go back, or before we finish, rather, let me go back all the way back to chapter one. Uh, well, actually, let's not chapter one, but um, I think it may be. got so many notes that's my problem i apologize for hunting for this because i should have had it right out in front i wanted to refer to it at the end it was the encounter uh between joshua and the lord it, it's it's uh chapter five Thanks, Christine. You keep up with these things better than I do. I, I was going to ask you to mention that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, because this, I think, is the key that we all need to come to when we are thinking about coming into the promised land. He had been told instructions by Moses and by the Lord, and he did follow them exactly. This is Joshua being told. He's the leader that was designated. After they had crossed the land, after the circumcision, after um, the setting up the stones of re remembrance, after doing all of those things and they're now in the land, Joshua is faced with the first battle that is before him in the promised land. This is the picture of spiritual warfare. The brand new believer enters into the new life, the new uh, way of living, the new way of thinking, and just as unsure as anybody about anything that is totally unknown, totally entered into by faith, we see the picture. This is chapter 5. Look down at verse 13. When Joshua was near Jericho, that this is before even the instructions about how to do all this, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. It's the picture of his encounter with the Lord Jesus. Joshua approached this man and asked him a very strange question. Are you for us or against us? Are you one of us or one of our enemies? Who are you? He didn't recognize who this was even though he is uh, very used to seeing God work miracles through Moses. He was there. He didn't recognize this man. He just saw an angel-looking uh, man, I guess, with a sword drawn in his hand. And the reply from this uh, angel of the Lord with a sword drawn said, no, essentially, and it says in this neither, but it really is no to both questions. 
I'm neither your enemy from your enemy or from your side. I am the commander of the Lord's army. That's us. We're the Lord's army. We belong to him. Joshua had to learn that it wasn't his people. He was put as a leader of God's people. They're not your people. They're my people. Uh, and I am the commander. I'm going to use you to lead them, but I am the commander. We need to see this so clearly. When we enter our new life in the promised land, we're not following a person. We are following the Lord Jesus. We go where he tells us to go and how he leads us, not a person. And he leads us, in our experience, he leads us through his word. He calls us to follow him, the commander of the army. Joshua realized that he was speaking to the Lord and was told, just like Moses, when you speak to the Lord, you take off your shoes because you're on holy ground. I think this is probably maybe the most important thing it was to me to learn. We are in, we are in battle in the promised land as a spiritual warfare, but we're not following a person. We're following the Lord Jesus. And we claim the promises, and let me just read them, sort of refer to them again that we've learned through all of these books that we've been studying so far. God is is who he says he is. God can do what he says he can do. And I need to see myself as how God sees me. I am one of the people in the land that he is a commander of. I'm one of the followers of him. And I can do all the things that he commands me to do because of his presence, his strength, his power in me. And God's word is alive and active in order to accomplish that. I think a marvelous lesson um, is for us here in, in Joshua. And I'm going to finish here recording. 